The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. I believe He lived and died, and that He rose again. I believe and trust in Him. Ascended into hell, Christ our living head will one day come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe and trust in him. I will trust in my redeemer, seeing of his love. That lasts forever Though it's full and sure salvation I will trust in Him Though the world falls around me I rest and know that He has found me Christ the rock is my Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Creed by Richard Jensen from his album Order of Service. By way of introduction, Pastor is an acrostic which stands for Preaching All Salvation Through One Redeemer. Our Redeemer, Yeshua, Jesus, is the Hebrew name for the Lord. It means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. Translated from Hebrew into the Greek language, the name Yeshua becomes Jesus. The English spelling for Jesus is Jesus. This program deals with apologetics, questions on and about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. I take questions and seek by scripture to give answers and encouragement for everyone, including the tough-minded living in today's skeptical society. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Welcome to Pastor Yeshua. In this episode... We begin delving into the tapestry of God's Word, the Bible, by looking at what Scripture refers to as types and shadows. In general, we know that Scripture gives us a glimpse into God's blueprint and master plan for all creation. It reveals that while we know God created all things from nothing, all things which He created to some degree are representative of realities which exist either in eternity, in heaven, or within the Godhead. Further, Rather than this fact being accidental, God has purposely chosen to reveal and manifest these realities to man through various mediums found here on earth. When these instances occur in nature, or the world around us, we generally call them signs, fingerprints of God, or evidence of intelligent design. As we study all of scripture, we tend to see that indeed God seems to create all things according to a pattern which testifies of Him. As we continue to look and study the visible and invisible things of creation, we are able to increasingly see God's reflection to some degree in that mirror. When these examples occur within scripture, we characteristically refer to them as types or shadows. We shall also see that ultimately, as within all scripture, that these types and shadows point to the substance, which is Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we ask that by your Spirit you would open the eyes of our hearts, minds and spirits so that by your grace we would receive and comprehend the richness and fullness of your word we thank you that you have seen fit to reveal the nature of who you are and what our relationship to you is we pray that your word would quicken our faith and bring greater depth and fullness to our fellowship with you through faith in our lord and savior jesus in jesus name amen Now as we construct the overall framework for our study of types and shadows, we find in the first mention of the subject of types and shadows, which comes from Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, where it says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of a holiday, or of new moon, 
or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ." Unquote. In reading the above verse, you will note that as the writer mentions the topic of shadows or types, the writer, under the inspiration of God's Spirit, then links the Sabbath to the issue of shadows. Thus, as we discuss types and shadows, we immediately discover that our discussion of the Sabbath, i.e. the day of rest, is precisely on target. Secondly, as earlier theorized, we find that ultimately all types and shadows point to the body, that is to say the substance, which is Jesus the Christ. We find the next mention of types and shadows in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 through 6, quote, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a high priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou maketh all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. But now he hath ordained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is a mediator of a better covenant, which is established upon better promises." Unquote. The second verse in question corroborates the theory offered, that many of the temporal things found in the Bible serve as types and shadows for substantive realities found in heaven, in eternity, or within the Godhead. Lastly, we find Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, quote, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they are offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect." Unquote. While we began our study of types and shadows in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 8 verses 1 through 6 clearly shows that God's will and desire to reveal himself goes back to the very beginning of his creation. Hebrews quotes what is probably the quintessential example of types and shadows, which is the tabernacle in the wilderness. As you will recall, beginning in Exodus chapter 25, God begins to instruct Moses and to institute instructions regarding how God wanted his people to worship him, as well as details on the tabernacle, which was the edifice where the center of worship would occur. These instructions laws, ordinances, and commandments were designed to provide the means and method by which God's people would approach God, have a relationship, and be accepted in His presence. Initially, Moses, Aaron, and God's people understood God's instructions to them as rudimentary rites, ceremony, and observances which man could perform and execute largely by his own efforts which would merit God's approval. As God revealed the details of the construction of the tabernacle, we read at least two interesting comments which deserve attention. Firstly, Exodus chapter 25, verse 9, which says, quote, According to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle, and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so ye make it, unquote. Secondly, Exodus chapter 25, verse 40, which says, quote, and look that thou make them after the pattern which was showed thee in the mount." Unquote. In the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5, looks back at the same event and comments, saying, quote, "...who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount." Unquote. In each case, the above passages clearly indicate that God was showing Moses, or was telling him about things which were in heaven. These things Moses was seeing were intended by God to serve as a pattern which Moses was instructed to copy. The passages previously cited from Colossians, Hebrews, and Exodus fully support the premise of a direct connection between types and shadows in creation, and substantive realities found in heaven, eternity, and or the Godhead. 
With this in mind, we turn to the subject of the day of rest, also known as the Sabbath, as a prime example of a type and shadow. Scripture reveals that in six days God created the heavens and the earth, light from darkness, the firmament and the waters, the grass, trees, and seeds, the sun, moon, and stars, as well as the creatures in the sea, sky, and land. Last of all, God created man in his own image. Afterward, God looked at all that he had created and declared it to be, quote, very good, unquote. Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, continues immediately thereafter and declares the following, quote, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in he had rested from all his work which God created and made, unquote. Now, giving clarity and substance for a type such as the day of rest could perhaps be analogized to trying to remember the notes from a piece of music forgotten long ago. Once the wrong notes from the wrong song start playing in one's mind, it is difficult, if not impossible, to ignore what erroneously clouds the process. Given the reality that man is now beset with sin, we would indeed have to adopt a sound, holistic approach drawn from Scripture in its entirety to discern the truth of the matter. So at the outset, let us begin the discussion with our type with a look at some basic definitions. The title of our episode, The Day of Rest, is a more general alternative to the word Sabbath. The first mention of the word Sabbath appears in Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, where it says, quote, And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made, unquote. The words, quote, and he rested, unquote, is translated from the Hebrew word Shavath, or Sabbath, which simply means to cease, to rest, or desist from labor. Next, there are the words, quote, rest, and, quote, work, which deserve notice. Now, first, there is the Hebrew word, melaka, which is translated occupation, work, or business. When we look at the English word, work, we find that the typical definition is a man or woman who expends physical or mental energy to perform, produce, or accomplish something. However, as we step back to an overall perspective, we must remember that whatever definitions we assign to define work, we do so largely from our experience post-fall. Because Adam and Eve fell into sin, we do not know what definition of work might have been applied to the word if Adam and Eve had remained in their unfallen state. To illustrate, let's ask the following questions. Would Adam and Eve, or any of mankind, needed to do any work as defined above if they had not sinned? If they did work, what would the work look like? If they were not doing any work, then how would anything get done which would require work? While the above definitions may apply to man, do they apply to God? Can God work according to the same definition as man? If not, in what sense does God work? Until chapter 2 of Genesis, God alone had been working in the sense that he was creating the universe and all that is from nothing. From what God has revealed, although God is triune, he needed no help outside his own nature and God had to do anything that he had done. The next word to discuss is the word rest. The English word rest is synonymously defined again from the Hebrew word which we get the English word Sabbath. In looking at the English word rest, we find that if we have correctly defined and understood work, then surely rest is diametrically opposed in definition and outcome to work. Thus, we would conclude rest would be a man or woman expending little or no physical or mental energy to perform, produce, or accomplish anything. Chapter 2 of verses 1 through 3 of Genesis records the first mention of God finishing his work, entering and sanctifying the day of rest. Scripture says that God rested the seventh day because the first six days he was quote-unquote working to finish creation. These verses beg two questions. One, the first question is, what, if any work, were Adam and Eve doing prior to the day of rest? 
And two, the second question is, if neither Adam nor Eve were doing work, then of what benefit would rest be for them? The answer to either question clearly suggests that for Adam and Eve to appreciate rest on the seventh day, they would have to have been participating in some form of work so that they could then slow down or stop and thereby rest. Having briefly defined and discussed work and rest, we must observe that the two terms, while divergent, are unavoidably connected. Imagine, if you will, a single horizontal scale with a single movable marker attached to that scale. The marker may be moved in either direction as far as desired. The moment the marker is moved in one direction to indicate an increase or decrease thereby, there is a resulting proportional decrease or increase in the opposite direction. If we apply the labels work and rest to the opposing ends of our imaginary scale, we find that the more one works, the less one rests. The more one rests, the less one works. The two terms are diametrically opposed. Now that we have a foundational understanding of the basic terms rest and work, we turn to ask the $24,000 question, what is the meaning of the day of rest? Having asked this question, it is crucial to take pause at this point and to remember to put things into proper theological perspective. Theoretically, had Adam and Eve maintained their perfect standing as the image bearers of God, the story would have altered significantly. Prior to the fall, there was no sin. Everything which God created was perfect by his estimation. There is absolutely no hint of anything which is a problem until we come to chapter 3, verse 1 of Genesis. It is therefore easy to quickly read chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, and perhaps simply make the assumption that God took the day off. In reality, this view would be highly anthropomorphic and consequently erroneous. God does not become tired or weary in the way men do. God does not need a day or time off to rest so as to strengthen himself. God remains strong and vigilant, so theoretically God could continue working throughout eternity and never need to slow down or stop for fear of losing momentum or energy. Thus we must conclude that God did not rest on the seventh day or any other day for uh, any of the fleshly, carnal reasons which we as humans are required to do for practical purposes. If God does not need to rest, then we must take up the next possibility for consideration. In this scenario, we assume that the reason for this day off was for the benefit of Adam and Eve, uh, or for mankind in general, if you will, recognizing in anticipation that they would need physical rest post-fall. While we must concede that this may have been part of the reason for instituting the day of rest, we must also point out the fact that at this point, when God instituted the day of rest, God had just created Adam and Eve, and the curse of chapter 3, verses 17 through 19 of Genesis had not yet fallen upon man. Consequently, the resultant consequence of Adam working by the sweat of his face to physically survive would not have been in effect as yet. Since all that was created at this point was good and perfect, there would be no effects from fatigue, death, aging, disease, etc. Therefore, neither Adam nor Eve had any physical need as we know it today for a day of rest. Given the fact that sin and its effects was yet to occur, it is entirely possible that had the status quo continued, that Adam and Eve would never know fatigue, weariness, or exhaustion, and thus rest would have been pointless as defined according to the terms offered thus far. At this point we should recognize the fact that the term work has different outcomes between God and man. When God works, his work is always good and perfect. He never gets tired. When man works, if he works apart from God, his work is imperfect and he becomes tired as a result. Even if man works with God's help, man becomes tired due to the effects of sin. If the outcome is good, 
it is only good to the extent that God is involved and not because of any power that man has by his own merit. The central determining factor as to whether man succeeds in accomplishing, performing, or producing something good is God's involvement and his will for the success of the end result. At this point, our discussion has presented five possibilities for God's institution of the day of rest. 1. The day of rest was created to somehow benefit God. 2. The day of rest was created to give Adam and Eve rest before the fall. 3. The day of rest was created in anticipation of the fall and man's need for physical rest due to the future effects of sin post-fall. 4. The day of rest was created simply to memorialize the finalization of creation and gradually turned into a liturgical covenant mandated by law. And five, the day of rest had or has some practical applications meeting the elements of points one through four above. However, these are the tip of the iceberg visible as types and shadows representative of another greater substance forecasted at the time of institution. Let's continue in hopes of answering which of the three holds the greatest theological sound merit to the question, what is the meaning of the day of rest? Possibility 1. The day of rest was created to somehow benefit God. Since we know God is omnipotent, we have already eliminated the possibility that God needed rest. While it is possible that God initiated the day of rest in order that he might have opportunity to facilitate receiving man's worship, honor and praise, the counter-argument which prevails says that every day should rightly be a day where man is giving worship, honor, and praise. Given this perspective, limiting worship, praise, and honor to and or for God to any single day would be highly insufficient for that purpose. Possibility 2. The day of rest was created to give Adam and Eve rest before the fall. First, by examining the text itself, we are reminded that as the sixth day was complete, God had finished all of his creation. Said another way, by the time the seventh day began, there was nothing more to be done by God or man. Everything that could or should have been done was done to completion and perfection. There was nothing whatsoever that God or man could add to what was done to make things better. Secondly, we know that from the context of surrounding scripture that since all was perfect and good, that Adam and Eve were God's image bearers, all that was required was simple faith and trust in God. It was only as a result of chapter 3 of Genesis as it unfolds that Adam and Eve chose to take their unconditional faith and trust off God and place it in their own abilities. Possibility 3. The day of rest was created in anticipation of the fall and man's need for physical rest due to the future effects of sin post-fall. If we make a literal definition of the seventh day as a day of rest purely necessary for some material reason, then we ultimately run into trouble. Once we divorce any spiritual attributes from the day of rest, all we are left with is a 24-hour period ostensibly necessary for rest to maintain some aspect of man's physical or mental health. While rest is very helpful, we know that many people can and do work every day of the week. Provided humans get an adequate amount of sleep each day, working all seven days is not automatically fatal to man. Given the versatility and flexibility of man as considered exclusively from a secular work versus rest schedule, we would have to conclude that the day of rest is recommended but not mandatory from a humanistic standpoint. We must attribute some aspect beyond the mere physical aspects in order to give purpose and meaning to the day of rest. Possibility 4. The day of rest was created simply to memorialize the finalization of creation and gradually